Good afternoon, and welcome to the second of our summer season of LACER webinars. I'm Stephen Foster, the National Chair for LACER this year, and hopefully most of you have been keeping up to speed with our activity and with my weekly updates these past few weeks. We're all getting used to using webinars and Zoom calls after these last few weeks, but just so that you're all aware, we have a question function on the webinar. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask Sharon or any of our other panelists this afternoon, please post them there so that we can use them in the panel discussion following our keynote speaker. I mentioned at the beginning, we also have the chat function. Uh, so if you want to make any comments rather than questions, please post these into the chat box. You'll find both of these along the bottom of your screen. As you're all aware, we're now moving on from the peak of the COVID-19 crisis. And with yesterday's announcements, and with yesterday's announcements, we're hoping that we can see a return to normality, whatever that may look like in the coming weeks. With the Prime Minister saying yesterday, very proudly in Parliament, that the government had a fantastic plan not to go back, but to spring forward to a better future. We're all looking forward to hearing the details of that plan in the coming weeks. Today, we welcome as our keynote speaker, someone very well known to us, a person who is very close to our industry and our service, and who's been an advocate for school food for very many years now. Not only an advocate for our service, but one of my Northeast neighbours and a very popular constituency MP, Sharon Hodgson. Sharon is now in the post of Shadow Minister for Veterans, but she hasn't moved away from her grasp of the her role as Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group for School Food. And we're pleased about that. We're pleased that you're staying with us, Sharon. Sharon's been recognised over the years by our industry for her support for everything that we do. And she's a regular fixture at our main event. So clearly she had to be the first parliamentarian that we've asked to speak in this summer series of webinars. Sharon, we're looking forward to hearing considering it's such a beautiful day. Thank you for um, joining us. Um, but then again, as is the beauty of um, this new world we're living in, you could actually be sitting in your garden doing this. So I think um, this, the world after lockdown could be very different because this could become um, more the norm instead of us all having to travel loads of miles um, to get to one venue. We could all be sitting wherever in the comfort of our home or garden um, and still taking part. So thank you. Um, and I look forward to, to questions later as well. Um, so I hope everyone um, is keeping well. Um, I hope none of you out there have had um, this dreaded virus. Um, and I hope that certainly you don't get it as we're now moving um, somewhat out of lockdown. Um, I have to say that one of the things I do miss about these events going online is the networking that we would all normally do before or after. Um, over a cup of coffee. So um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to be able to do that today, but I'm sure you'll still find this session fulfilling. Um, and also, if there's anything you want to bring to my attention after the session, please do email me. And Jess, my parliamentary assistant, who's also on this chat, um, will put my um, details in the, the, the chat box for you all. So as Stephen said, I'm Sharon Hodgson, the Member of Parliament for Washington and Sunderland West and I'm currently Shadow Minister for Veterans. But as he said, I'm Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group um, on School Food, which is a very, very active group. We've got 240 on our mailing list. We don't always get as many MPs and peers as we would like, but um, the ones that do, who are really passionate about this, um, you know, attend as regularly as they can. I set the group up in 2010 and I've been proud to be the chair ever since. And um, we've done some great work together um, with the sector over those years. So I, um, as I've said recently in the media, I grew up on school meals. 
and so the importance of specifically free school meals has also been you know very important to me and I know how important they are to so many families on low incomes it's particularly now we're seeing people on universal credit for the first time on furlough losing that what they're going to go on sadly those on furlough a couple of maybe a million or more of them their jobs won't exist anymore so they'll be going from furlough to universal credit and then, therefore onto school meals um, so many people have had their incomes squeezed significantly and so many of my constituents have been contacting me to say how anxious they are about their finances um, and you know the access how much they value therefore the access to the national food voucher scheme or the alternative provision that has been provided by um, some schools where they've carried on providing um, a school meal service. It really has been a lifeline for so many families in these uncertain times, as I'm sure you all are aware. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I know there have been a lot of problems with the scheme. Um, the whole fact that Eden Red was chosen, there was no sort of um, proper process that were just plucked out of the air and there's been so many problems and whether it's who is eligible getting the vouchers to the right people making sure the vouchers are used for healthy food making sure the right supermarkets are on the list it wasn't just waitrose and marks and spencers um making sure that the vouchers are valid um and you know now we've also heard that fraud fraudulent vouchers are entering the system um this is just really really has not been um you know ideal at all but um you know families have relied on them and i know that many of you will have brought you know many of these issues not only to my attention but to the attention of the department more importantly um and i hope that you will continue to do so as i will um as well and it was fantastic last week. We all got to agree that um, we received another government U-turn. That will mean children will have access to free school meals, provision vouchers over the summer holidays. Um, we'd all been pushing for this for years and the intervention of Marcus Rashford was greatly appreciated. It has to be said, it got the issue into the public consciousness in a way that, you know, all of us banging on about it for years just wasn't achieving. And that put extra pressure on the government to make a change. I mean, it was quite shocking that the Prime Minister said that he only heard about this issue on the day that, you know, he made the U-turn. It's just, it makes you realise that we can all bang on about it, we're blue in the face and, you know, you've still got the most important man in the country with regard to making that change, hadn't heard about it. But then again, it's whether or not you believe he was telling the truth when he said that. But as Marcus pointed out, and as we all know, children not having access to food over the holidays isn't a new coronavirus related problem. We've known for years that this has been an issue and it will continue to be an issue for many years to come unless the government makes holiday provision a permanent feature, which is what we've all um, said for a number of years. I think it's been about eight years ago, this was raised on the All Party Group initially by Lindsay Graham. And, you know, we changed our terms of reference to include um, holiday hunger um, as part of uh, something we would concentrate on. So, you know, this is not going to go away just when the, the, the virus goes away. So whilst it's good we've secured food provision for this Sunday, we can by no means rest on our laurels, and I know we won't. We've got a long way to go to show the government that some children and families need access to food provision over the holidays every year, not just this year. And why they can't already say that, I don't know, um, but we really do need to keep this on the agenda, so I, I know that we will. And the same goes for universal infant free school meals. The Prime Minister likes to think it was the Conservative government that introduced them and whilst I agree with Stephen it's great that we've managed to get him to the stage where he's talking them up and he's saying he's proud of them which is what we did with David Cameron and that's how we protected them the last time they were under threat when George Osborne was going to use them for um, to cover the, the election bribe for the increased childcare remember when they increased it to 30 hours to gazump Labour's offer in the election. Well, they didn't have the money for it, and Nicky Morgan and George Osborne are going to use the Universal Free School Meals money for it till you know we launched a big campaign. I managed to get in on PMQs and goaded Cameron into saying he'd go down in history as Dave the Dinner Snatcher. 
and he said, you know, we brought them in, you didn't, you had 13 years, Labour never brought them in, we've got them and we're keeping them. Now, the risk is, we know that um, Gove didn't want them. And at the time, a man called Dominic Cummins, who worked for Gove, said that free school meals were just a gimmick. Now, Dominic Cummins works in number 10, as we all know, for Boris. So that's how it was really important when Boris said what he said and said he was proud of the infant free school meals. So um, we have to make sure, you know, that uh, we keep an eye on that because we know we've only got them because they were in the school food plan that a lot of you worked on to ensure that, you know, universal free school meals got in the school food plan, as I did with them, um, um, Henry and John, who initially on day one, when I first met with them, and he said, what would I like to see? And I said, you know, food back on the curriculum, the importance of food being understood by head teachers and all of that. Then I said, and universal free school meals. And I remember John, sweet as he was, laughing his head off, saying, that's never going to happen, Sharon, we're not socialists. So when you know, nine months later, after they'd been away, did their research, went round school, saw the Durham pilot, the um, the Newham pilot, what had happened, what was happening in Islington and in Southwark, and saw the research that number seventeen in the school food plan was universal free school meals. You know, it was amazing that we got them, but it was Nick Clegg who then introduced them as part of the coalition agreement as a quid pro quo when the Tories wanted to bring in um, the married couples tax allowance. So, you know, they were never on the Tories wish list, but we've got them and we've got to keep them and where, you know, it's got to be our number one priority. So the government haven't yet announced the spending for the next academic year, um, which obviously would include universal infant free school meals. So we'll be pressuring them on that and on the fact that the Prime Minister, again, will use the fact that he's proud of them um, campaigning. I know that some people are incredibly concerned about the future of school meals in general and that school meat kitchens reopening in light of the voucher scheme. So, you know, I share your concerns. I don't take for granted that, you know, the, that people will have been getting used to getting that money and may sort of, you know, say, oh, we don't want school meals. Let's just keep getting the money. It's much better. I've never, I fought against monetarising free school meals when universal credit was introduced. It was talked about then that it was too complicated with the various cliff edges and that there was talk of monetarising it then. We put in... Um, Lisa and myself and a number of MPs put in submissions to the Social Security Advisory Fund, talk speaking against that option. Um, so again, I would fight to the death over that. And so please keep campaigning on that and raising your concerns, but, but know that on the Labour benches, all Labour MPs agree that we must keep a school food offer and children getting food in schools, cooked in schools, just as it was before um, this awful shutdown happened. And indeed, there'll be num on the, the SNP benches, the Lib Dems, and also on the Conservative benches. Um, I know there'll be MPs who won't want to let that happen. So, you know, we certainly won't sit quiet um, and we will make sure um, the government um, know, and I'm sure the sector will make sure the government know how we feel about that. Um, I'll also be urging the government to update their guidance on the eligibility for free school meals for the children with no recourse to public funds. Um, now, after campaigning by the amazing um, Nadia from the uh, Hackney Migrant Centre and Sustain, brilliant campaign on this that brought it to my attention for the first time, that those children and the families with no recourse to um, public funds had had the same ceiling of 7,400 with regard to eligibility for free school meals that the rest of the population who has access to public funds such as universal credit etc and how nonsensical that was. Again this was something that I think just through ignorance nobody in the government had really looked at it and realised how stupid it was because obviously 7,400 for families with no recourse to public funds is literally 7,400 whereas for families who are on universal credit it can be 18, 19, 20, 21,000 when you take into account child benefit and universal credit and stuff like that. So I wrote to the Minister, Sustain wrote to the Minister, Hackney Migrant Centre, been campaigning on this and 
Lo and behold, with no fanfare, a few weeks ago, the government raised the maximum eligibility criteria to 16,190, but they haven't updated their guidance. So the guidance online still says 7,400. Jess and I just checked it just before we came on this call. So local authorities are still not able to provide free school meals to these families, because when they go to check the eligibility, it still says 7,400. Now, you know, either that's either deliberate or it's accidental either way it's not good enough and it's disgraceful i think so we've um put a name day question down that should have been answered on the 22nd calling for the guidance to be updated they should have answered it on the 22nd we've been in touch with the clerks in the house of commons today to see what recourse we've got when the government haven't answered a question like this so we, they've told us what we need to do. So we're going to be doing that. Might might end up being points of order on the floor of the house if we can't get any, um, you know, progress on this. So I'm on the case. But while this bureaucracy is going on, there's still children out there not getting their free school meals, and that means they're not going to get the voucher for over the summer if we don't manage to get it sorted out. Um, in time but again that isn't just for christmas or just for coronavirus is the the as the guidance when you you see what has been changed it says this is temporary we don't want it to be temporary it should be permanent these children there's only 215,000 of them um unless they're in a family that is you know substantially getting um more than 16,000 a year i think their children should be getting free school meals um so coronavirus has changed a lot of things, but it hasn't changed our determination to make sure that all children have access to healthy food. And I say all children because I've always believed this should be universal because just because you a child could be in a family where, um, you know, they have a good income, two parents, good jobs, um, you know, plenty of money, doesn't mean that child is necessarily getting healthy food, healthy, you know, the ability to feed your kids takeaways or ready meals, as I've often said, you know, you'll have heard me, a ready meal from Marks and Spencer's or Waitrose is still just a ready meal, as one from Aldi or Asta is. It doesn't mean that, you know, it just means that have more money to buy more unhealthy food that's why it's so important that all children get one good meal a day during term time and obviously we have some um then capacity to feed the poorest and those who need it during holiday times as well so we're all going to remain united and keep the pressure on the government to show exactly why children and families need access to food keep making the case for holiday provision breakfast clubs as well. I'm a massive advocate of breakfast clubs and universal free school meals. Infant is what we have eventually pushed for universal across the board. Um, we all know how important those things are and we need to keep shouting as loud as we can to ensure that the government hear us because as we know we've done a lot of shouting but Boris only heard when Marcus got involved or so he says. So I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions and of course working with you all going forward on all these very important issues. Thank you. And back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Sharon. That was most enlightening and as always hearing your thoughts, um, both about the return to school, but more, more importantly about the anxieties on finance that are affecting so many people at the, mo at the moment, um, is really sort of, um, you know, sort of good that we've got people like yourself that are fighting that fight. And particularly the points that you made about the income assessment for entitlement to free school meals. So, you know, there's, I've noticed sort of on the chat function on the side of the webinar, there are some points being made by two or three of our um, attendees um, about sort of the increase that they're seeing in free school, free school meal claims that possibly are linked to the incentives of the vouchers. But I think that, you know, sort of as they're doing the checking at the minute, that some of those claims are quite speculative. But I guess that if that income assessment has changed, it's going to be something that is really going to change the number of children that are entitled to free school meals. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And of course, pupil premium as well, because that that's linked to yeah. the pupil premium, which means that the schools are going to, you know, benefit from having more money coming in to support those children and narrow that gap. I think 
you know, as always, hearing your thoughts about our service has always been really in interesting. And I, and, and I think sort of you talk about, you know, sort of the, uh, the school meal that we provide being the hot meal that is guaranteed to get food into children's tummies. Because, you know, anecdotally, um, the vouchers aren't necessarily always getting to the children's yeah. tummies. And we're still getting children that potentially are on vouchers presenting in some of our schools asking if they can have something to eat. Um, um, you know, and that's happening in County Durham. Um, you know, so it, it is something that's not sort of just far away. It's something that's quite close yeah. to home for us. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, sort of you mentioned and, and, and I think probably didn't labour on the target of extending universal infant preschool meals to all children. And, you know, it's something that LASA and, and all our members are committed to delivering. And we're going to be talking about that in sort of the next few uh, months as we sort of get back to school and move out of sort of the recovery phase from COVID into sort of a rethinking phase as to how we can do things perhaps differently and join up things like breakfast clubs, after school clubs, um, you know, holiday provision and everything else with the service that our members, you know, provide across all schools. The next part of our webinar this afternoon is our panel discussion. And I'm pleased to introduce Jackie Blake, our National Vice Chair, um, who keeps me right all the time, and Katie Evans, who is the Head of Derbyshire County Catering Services, and she's also a LACE board member. There are panellists alongside Sharon today. We've received a number of questions that people have submitted in advance, and I can see that the Q&A uh, function is getting some additional questions in there. So to use our time effectively, I'll kick off straight away with the first question. Do you think, and this has come from, uh, first of all, from Linda Mitchell, do you think that the risk of losing universal infant free school meals funding altogether has been reduced by the high profile U-turn around holiday meal vouchers? Or will the financial crisis post COVID allow government to target this as a saving once again? Sharon, I'll come to you first with that one. Um, well, as I said, I, I, I think the, the fact there's gonna be more and more people entering um, the free school meal world for the first time um, after the crisis when the children go back because the numbers who have been furloughed and won't be going back onto um, into work will you know be applying for free school meals and so you know the, I don't think the, um, there'll be any um, appetite for it to be relaxed at all. I think, you know, people will want it to go back to how it was. Um, the sector obviously wanted to go back to how it was. And I think the majority, the vast majority of, of parents will. There might be some who, as you say, who've been getting those 15 pounds and spending them on, I don't know what, um, because they can't spend them on, supposedly, they're not able to spend them on, um, you know, non-food items it has to be food but as we know they could be spending it could be 15 pounds worth of crisps 15 pounds worth of chocolate 15 pounds worth of, of I, I don't know um i don't you know i've never sort of been at the tail to watch what someone is able to buy with them so if anybody has got any anecdotal um you know evidence of, of that and as you say the thought that it's not actually reaching the children in the form of some sort of food you know as bad as crisps and chocolate would be at least if they were getting that but by the sound of it some mightn't even be getting um anything so obviously we it's got to go back to being delivery in school as it was um and you know that will probably be substantially an increased amount um, initially, um, which is sad in a way. It's good for the school food service because, you know, we need more people to partake in it, it the, the, the families to understand. So if some of these families might be entering the benefit system for the first time, they'll realise in some ways, you know, how bureaucratic and awful it is, like the five-week wait for universal credit and stuff like that. That helps us campaign for a better benefit system and one of the things Jonathan Reynolds is talking about we've got to have a more contributory um, benefit system that sort of means for it's got to be fair and this is where he's getting um, some criticism when he said this because you've got some you know disability groups and that saying we don't want a two-tier system but that's not what he's talking about he's talking about a fair system for everyone 
but it also a fair system for people who might only ever dip into it for short periods of time. At the moment, those people who might have been working all their life and then dip in for a short period of time can often find they've got too many savings or their other half works, then they're not entitled to anything. And it feels really unfair when you're, for their, those people, and I'm not saying they're right to think this, but I just know this is what they think. When they're the ones paying for it for everyone else, their whole life, the one time they've ever made to needed it, they get nothing from it. They then resent the fact that they're paying into a welfare state. We don't, we want everyone to feel they get something from the welfare state and it not just to be the NHS. So when people enter into needing to rely upon, say it's free school meals, we want those to be the best meals they possibly can, which they are. And we want them to sort of then see that actually wouldn't it be good if everyone got these? Even when I go back to work, I want my kids to still be able to get these meals because they're so good. So that is what I'm hoping might be a, another positive takeaway. We've got to look for the positive takeaways. Jackie and, and Katie, can I come to you just with that question? In, in terms of sort of the deliverables that you're seeing in your schools, um, obviously, we've we've not necessarily been providing those infant free school meals, but we're seeing our infants and and um, you know coming back to school now. Are you seeing that children are coming back and having a meal, or are the schools sort of still pushing children towards the vouchers? Um, well, in in Nottingham, we've got a bit of a mix actually. Um, I think in, again, it depends on the size of the school, the capacities in classrooms. So we, we had a very slow start. They only started with year six. So it's only this week that we've seen um, a gradual increase. Um, and I think um, certainly the biggest question that most head teachers are wanting to know is around the six week period and answers to those questions. But as regards the here and now, um, yeah, real mix. Um, quite a lot of meals, some hot, but mostly because the weather's nice and obviously it facilitates them sitting outside if they want to, um, at quite a lot of packed lunches. Um, but yeah, some hot. Okay, thank you. Katie, you've got quite a different estate to, to Jackie who runs, you know, sort of service in Nottingham. Um, and in Derbyshire, you've got that sort of huge mix of, of sort of schools with your tiny village schools out in the Dales. And, you know, sort of some of your bigger city schools, but, you know, sort of a different mix. And are you seeing a different picture to that emerge as far as your infants returning to school? Um, in truth, we've had quite a lot of pupils um, at school throughout the whole event. We had only 3% of our schools actually closed during the, um, during the period before, before early June. So and they went into hub kitchens, um, so into hub schools as well. So similar to Jackie, we've got a mixed picture. Some schools are insisting that the children bring in packed lunches from home. Um, we've got some schools who are having hot meals through the counter with limited number of pupils and extended lunch breaks. We've got cold packed lunches being served in classrooms. Um, you might even only have 15 pupils on school and you've got three different remote areas that they're serving the packed lunches in. And then we're also having hot meals served in classrooms as well. We've designed a new menu in Derbyshire that's suitable for, and we call it hot to go, and it's suitable for actually carrying from the counter to the classroom. Um, so in other words, no sort of liquid items really that will slide off the plates as they're, as they're walking. So, so there's a few, there's a big variety um, and our numbers are building quite dramatically um, in the south of Derbyshire. We have got, they're now moving on to the year fives going into, into some schools as well. So they're, start, they're really starting to build the numbers up, which is interesting. If I just pick up on um, what Sharon was saying about the number of people that are entitled to free school meals. Um, the free school meals eligibility department in Derbyshire actually sits under the catering service. And I can just give you some figures on that if that's of interest to you. In that, a, um, prior to COVID, we had about 19,000 children who were eligible for free school meals in Derbyshire. And during the first six weeks of the COVID um, pandemic, we had 737 families um, become entitled to um, free school meals, um, el eligible for free school meals. Now, there may be one, there may be two, there may be three children or whatever in that family. So I'm not saying it's not 737 children it's going to be definitely be more than that. So there's a big, big increase in the number in Derbyshire. So that really has uh, ramped up. And in terms of the um, use of the vouchers, 
Um, anecdotally in Derbyshire, we have had quite a few problems with people on Facebook saying that they bought all their new summer outfit from the supermarket um, with their new vouchers that they've received. You know, so there, we do have concerns. So we've continued to offer food hampers into schools, um, two weekly food hampers, which are very, very popular due, due to the rurality of some of the schools where the supermarkets aren't appropriate and travel is required. So a mixed picture. Okay. I think that, that there's, we've got another couple of questions about universal infant free school meals. Um, and Michael Lamb from Gateshead, uh, Sharon, who I know you've, uh, you were aware of from our Northeast uh, Mafia. Um, um, Michael's asked, do you think that we can not only keep universal infant free school meals, but persuade the government to extend them for all primary children? And I think that that, for me, is a question that again is linked to this increase in, we're seeing more and more children that are going to become entitled to free school meals. It almost makes it the right thing to do, to say that we provide a meal for every child, as opposed to, you know, sort of having some children that will fall into free school meals and some that will fall just out of free school meals, but whose families potentially could be, um, you know, just as vulnerable and just as hard up as the ones that have actually ended up getting the benefit. Have you got a view on that? And do you think that we might be able to get the government to listen to that train of thought? Well, well that's always been um, the angle I've come at it. You know, when they talk about, we had the debate around the 7,400 um, and, you know, some of the, the the conservatives were just so sort of deaf to the fact that the the effect of those who you know the working poor are the ones who are just above that and just don't qualify and you know the working poor is you know often the, the term um coined for those and um that's why i say you know the whole means testing the only part of the child's school day that is means tested is the food and that's the thing that they need to literally be able to survive and learn you know they, they get the, they get the best teachers they get the desks their chairs you know all of their learn you know the when it comes to using their computers pcs it's not oh well these ones are only for the kids on free school meals you've got to bring your own because you know we're, we've means tested your family it's just ludicrous the rest of the school day is provided um, at taxpayers' expense apart from um, the means testing of school food and, you know, arguing about, you know, who, sh who should be getting it and who shouldn't. It just should be, to me, provided as a given to all. We should be getting past this, you know, um, who gets it and who doesn't. And I'm just reading down, you know, some of the comments in about what the the, the voucher money has been spent on. And if that is not, we must save this chat. If that is not evidence for if we do ever have to defend um, keeping hot food provision in school rather than it being monetarized, it, it's this. Because, you know, when you think those vouchers are going to the poorest families, the families with, um, you know, no wage coming in, you're usually you're out of work if you're getting free school meals. And to think that, you know, it's some of the things people are choosing to buy and I think because they're able as someone said I did think about this to sort of you know you might have you've got your basket of shopping that comes to 30 pound and 15 pound is vouchers and so even if somebody challenged them they would say oh well whatever little food they've got in there they would say that was what they were buying with the vouchers and that the rest they were buying with their own money when we probably know that the little bit of food that we're probably going to buy already and it's the toys or the clothes that they've bought with the vouchers you know you can it's almost impossible to police and i'm sure there's the majority of families out there are doing the right thing and buying food for their kids with this money but you know we know um you know what happens and the temptations so yeah well i th I think the only way to solve all of this is it's got to be provided in school. Yeah, I think I'd that agree that... with that as well, actually, because we know from our own experience of the brought in packed lunches and the and the quality of them that on average it's only one percent that meets. And we've all got horror stories of what's in a packed lunch. Um, so why will it be any different when they're just doing it at home? Yeah, we've we've had a question come in, and I, I'm. I'm sort of linked, staying with the uh, the theme and moving on from infant free school meals to the uh, the vouchers. Will pressure now be on the government to retain free school meal vouchers for future holiday periods? 
And will there be an associated risk that to balance the school meals books that the government look to remove or reduce something else? Um, you know, and you know, sort of the, the obvious candidate is infant preschool meal scheme, justifying that by that they've improved holiday holiday provision for free school meal children. That's come from John Figgins from uh, from West Sussex. Jackie, you're you're on screen. So do you want to just sort of let us sort of hear your thoughts on that, and then perhaps we'll pass back to Sharon and see whether or not there is that sort of game going on in in Parliament in terms of budgets. Yeah, I think um, it's all right having the funding to run these holiday clubs, but unless um, we've all got that and we're all successful, then there's going to be some real pocket. So by just providing the vouchers without those sort of match to the holiday clubs and the actual food provision, um, all those children are going to be missing out again. So it's 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 a very unfair battle. I mean, we in Nottingham didn't didn't get it last year, um, and there's a huge amount of work gone on to try and fund um, some holiday clubs and activities. And I think everybody agrees it's not just the food alone; it's that safe environment through the holiday and other activities as well. But it's really important to have the food, and and I just think that by having vouchers over the holidays um, is just going to per perpetrate the um the problem that perpetuate the problem that we've got um so yeah I, I think we should be pushing for um some summer holiday clubs for all school for all schools and they need to catch up with the learning as well yeah and, and sharon do you think that that might come at the expense of something else some other benefit you know there's only so much money to go around yeah, I mean, that is the fear, Stephen, yeah, you're yeah, right, that, um, you know, they'll play sort of a trade-off and say, oh, well, yes, you know, summer, summer feeding is so important, so we think that, therefore, um, the parents who can afford to feed their kids, which this is an argument, you know, who are getting the universal infant free school meal offer, that actually they should feed their own kids during term time, and let's move that money over and use it for the, the holidays for the, the poorest kids. Um, that would be such a, a, a backward step, in my opinion, um, because especially if they then just replaced those lovely hot meals for all kids with vouchers in the summer for the poorest, we're going to see even more um, of what we're talking about here, with the, what the vouchers perhaps being spent on things other than food. And what we want to see in the summer, it's not just about um, feeding those kids, it's holidays and activities. We've always pushed that these kids are not just the poorest, they're often the, more, the, the least stimulated. You know, they're not going off on some fabulous two week holiday to, to Cornwall or to France or to Greece and going to go and look at monuments and museums. You know, they're not having any of those stimulating or being taken to museums and art galleries every day. I'll never forget a teacher in the old fold when I covered Gateshead, there's a brand new MP and I sort of had grown up on benefits and on free school meals. So I was one of those where I thought, you know, unlike some of our Tory friends and other MPs of all parties who, you know, have never been on benefits and never experienced poverty. I thought, I know poverty, I know what it's like to be poor. And I'm talking to this head teacher and he's saying about um, the experience of some of his kids in the summer. And he says, Sharon, he says, they never go across the doors. And I went, oh yes, you know, thinking to myself, yeah, I know what it's like to be poor. It's going, they never go across, and I was going, you know, nodding and agreeing. He says that, that their world is so small. He says, you know, he says, when they leave here on the Friday of the summer holidays and they come back, on the Monday in September, he says, for some of them, they've never been off this estate. He says, they've not been to Southwell Park. He says, they haven't been to Colour Court or Whitley Bay. He says, they've been nowhere. They haven't been to Newcastle, the Metro Centre. Honestly, the tears in my eyes and my mouth fell over, open because I thought, I thought I knew poverty and I did, but I had a great man who did as much as she could for us. She took us away. I was in a jazz band, so I went on trips. That was not my experience of poverty. And I realised there's different level and different experiences of poverty. So what we'll be seeing is some people abusing these vouchers and not putting their kids first, sadly. But we'll be seeing some amazing mums and parents out there who'll be doing the right thing. But what we need, therefore, 
is a summer and feeding and activity. There has to be um, learning and things for these kids to do over the summer. So that's not just about sort of extending this voucher scheme at all. It, we need a whole different programme to close the gap. Use the pupil premium money. Use whatever, you know, a version of that extended into the holidays for, for these vulnerable kids. And if you've got to have a government though that really cares about closing the gap, and this government will just want to balance the books in the easiest way possible. They really aren't focused on closing the gap the way we are. Yeah, yeah. I think that sort of money is is obviously at the centre of everything that we do. And um, just before the um, the COVID crisis uh, kicked off, um, we at LASA had put in a submission to the Treasury for an increase in um, the value of universal infant free school meals and. We'd, we'd taken the FSA's uh, guidance in terms of increasing the £2.30 allowance to 2 51 which is yeah. effectively where we believe that, you know, sort of £2.30 in 2014-15 when it was introduced. So we're overextending that, that request. Um, Jenny Pittam from Tower Hamlets has said, if £3 is given, being given for free school meals throughout COVID, why can't caterers and schools be funded for the same amount, both for free school meals and universal infant free school meals from September? Mm -hmm. This would allow contractors to increase the meal price to our clients and help cover increasing staff and food costs. And Jenny says, particularly in London, um, but I, I would say that it goes beyond London because in London, you've got lots of big schools where you can get some economy of scale on labor, particularly, but the two pound 30 charge is uh, is now inadequate, I would say, across everybody's estate. And I think, um, Katie in Derbyshire, you run a lot of small schools and quite clearly £2.30 isn't enough to keep your service valid in small schools, as well as big schools where you've got the London living wage that has impacted that. So Kate, do you want to just come in on that in terms of sort of where you think we should be campaigning for sort of that three pounds to be at least translated into money that's coming into the service that we provide. Yeah, I think you're quite right, Stephen, that um, across the piece, depending on the types of schools that you operate, it's a different cost. But um, I think Lace's approach of going for a three, for a three pounds, 50, sorry, two pounds 51 um, value is about right because you can't outprice um, and try to you know try to get too much that we're not going to get approved. It's got to be a realistic value that can be justified monetary um, and financially. So it's got a good case behind it, a sound case that we're going to actually get this increase from. Um, as you rightly say, in Derbyshire, um, the cost of providing some meals in some schools can be as much as nine pounds a head for a meal. So yeah, uh, and you couldn't you know you put a price in at that. So you know you have to be realistic, and I think quite right. I think the two pounds fifty one level is about the right level. Yeah. And, and Sharon, can we get you to from from an APPG perspective, put some support behind that claim so that you know we can be getting your support in terms of going back to Treasury and DfE. Yeah, and saying that we need the, the universal infant free school meal funding to go up and get your party behind that sort yeah. of to make sure that we can get back to work. Yeah, absolutely. And Jess will tell me or correct me. Um, I'm sure we'd written before, you know, after the APPG where we discussed this and we were sort of trying yeah. to come up with the right figure. And I think that's where we settled on the 251. I think it can be up to, I wrote down 273 or something. There'd been various sort of yeah. studies. That's it, but we thought that might be too greedy initially. But actually, that would be more 70%. Yeah, it should be like three pounds if you're looking at what the government have given out in the ventures. It should be three pounds. So, 251 calling for 251 is you know a bargain, really. Um, maybe we should be calling for a bit more. But I, I'm thinking now I might give a region figure between like 251 and 273, but I'm sure we did. Um, a letter to um, the, the the Gavin or um, Vicky Ford after that all party group. So, and um, I will definitely make sure Tulip is the new schools food minister covering school food. Tulip Siddiqui. So I will make sure I bring her up to speed on all of this. She's so open to this agenda, which not all people since me in that position, because I used to do that job, 
um, she's the most open to this agenda. Um, she's been great at, at liaising with us and wanting to get the lines right. So I'll make sure she gets the lines right on this. Perfect. And Sharon, I think that sort of we've we've accepted that we've had the vouchers and that they've filled a gap. They've been a stopgap. And to be fair to Vicky Ford, the message that she sent out has been first and foremost use your school caterers to continue providing a service. I think that what we're now concerned about is the impact on COVID-19 on jobs in the sector, um, yeah. both for our employee base, the frontline service providers, because as sort of volumes have gone down and income is becoming reduced, employers are feeling really challenged with that. But also beyond that, into the supply chain as well, you know, and, and you know that many of our sort of members in Leicester uh, come from the food service supply chain as well yeah. and clearly sort of their jobs are, are, are under threat as well we've seen two or three companies go to the wall you know through this yeah. in not very well all the campaigning around vouchers but what we need, do need is to be mindful that we've got a hundred thousand jobs at risk in our service as well and yeah. you know we, we we really would value your support in terms of saying you know like the vouchers being great but let's get back to having food in schools yeah absolutely I, and you know i will um you know make sure it, the next or any opportunity i've got to say that i absolutely will um so i will look for i will look for an opportunity to make sure i get that message out there great thank you we know that uh, the school food standards uh, are under review as well. Um, and we've seen the impact of COVID-19 on child nutrition and health. Um, you know, Boris himself has talked about sort of child obesity and you know, he talked about the impact of his own weight on his experience of COVID. Um, you know, yeah. We want to ca carry on with that work. And I think that again, where do you think sort of we, we need to balance that in terms of sort of our campaigning on obesity and child obesity particularly linked to, you know, sort of getting back to school and having a, a decent school meal? Yeah, that's a really good point because I think all, I think all adults, everyone out there will be open to this argument because I've put weight on, I, I did not need to put any weight on, but I have, my husband has, my son has you know because he's been working from home he works for the nhs but he's working from home and honestly i keep thinking they'll, they'll roll us out of this house when this is all all over and so you know i think lots of people will be will be feeling that and they'll recognize that you know it'll, if, if, if it's for the adults it'll be the same effect on the children and what school food does is give them a hot healthy balanced meal every day that with the best will in the world, you know, especially for parents who've been working at home, trying to feed their, their kids while they're working, it's so easy just to, you know, grab something or, you know, the, the, the fridge in the cupboard's just far too close. You know, you just have to, you know, you just have to pop into a different room and, you know, it's there. Um, and obviously for the kids at home, and looking, luckily in the households where they do have food in the cupboards and, you know, biscuits and access to, you know, just the kids, also been home just being able to go in the fridge or in the biscuit tin and grab stuff so i think for all parents they'll be recognizing that actually you know my kids put weight on over the time we've been at home and you know they were never this weight when they're at school getting fed for their substantial meal for 190 days of the year was at school um you know i think the it'll be easy to make that argument as well as the argument that we've all made about um, hunger and obesity being two sides of the same coin that often the poorest kids are also the chubbiest kids and it's not because they're not experiencing hunger they'll experience terrible hunger but then it'll get met with sort of sometimes calorific food um, that isn't actually you know satisfying the hunger but it's putting the calories in yeah um, I think that we're sort of getting into our last 10 minutes um, and, and I want to move away slightly from sort of the um, the comments and, the, and the, the conversation we've had on infant free school meals and the vouchers. To ask Sharon, um, what work MPs are doing in Parliament to advocate for the school food sector during the pandemic, and how to support the sector in a wide reopening of a wider reopening of schools? And then the second part is, 
and how can we in the school food sector help the work of MPs and the APPG in raising some of these issues into sort of the arena where they can become more than just sort of the converted that are, are sort of um, speaking about these things. You know, and, I, and I look at the converted, people like yourself, Truly, um, Alex Norris, you know, we've got people that are actually very much engaged on behalf of the sector. So um, you know, like what you're doing or what the MP is doing and what we can then do to you know, sort of help you in, in sort of delivering that. Yeah. I don't think with regard to what's being in Parliament, because all of us are not there, obviously we went into you know, the extended sort of recess at the start of this and then the virtual Parliament and even now we've only got some there, um, you know, I haven't been back yet, I'm still taking part virtually. So, and also Parliament isn't sitting fully, it's still a very much trimmed down, so it's really hard, there's no Westminster Hall debates taking part, it's really hard to get any backbench business debates on, and all the issues tend to be sort of um, key issues around the economy, I don't think anyone, I don't think I've seen any debate come up that would have been on our agenda yet, if you know, other than the one we had, obviously, notwithstanding the one last week around the um, summer feeding, which again, um, we had already put in for that um, before Mark called, because the timing of the opposition day debates, it was already decided we were going to do that. And Tulip and Rebecca had launched the campaign actually on the Sunday. It was all set. Jess had been working with their advisors the week before on getting the wording right. So we had launched the Labour campaign for the summer. Um, the, what, what, what do they call it? Sort of end holiday hunger or whatever it was called. The days without um, hunger holidays without hunger that was it so that had all got launched um with the plp and we were going to have this huge campaign marcus then sent us all all the mps a letter on the monday and by the tuesday of the debate um the u-turn the u-turn had happened so it it made me sort of you know i spoke about it on a call last week about the perfect storm that seemed to come about because you know, we were all doing it, campaigners have been doing it, the, the perfect stall con consists of the work we were doing, it consisted of um, the, the, the campaign by um, uh, the Good Law Society and Sustain, was it, the, um, the, to go to court, you know, for the court action, so there was that. There was uh, the MPs, Labour MPs, the, that campaign, and there was the opposition day debate, which was looming, and then Marcus got involved, and the thought of Tory MPs having to troop through their lobbies in the red wall seats and the marginal seats to vote against feeding the kids of the most vulnerable families, that probably numbered more than their majority, the number of families, it, you know, it wasn't lost on them. So thinking of that, it, is a learning how we take it forward with regard to the other things we're talking about, like the increase in the two of um, proper summer feeding and activity programs, the protection of infant birth. Sort of when we think about that, sadly, there doesn't seem to be a need to get maybe a celebrity to get a celebrity to get public opinion more up there and um, to bring it to the attention of those conservative. MPs who, frankly, we know they're in different constituencies to the type of constituencies that ever held before, and it will make them think differently about their priorities. So, how we maybe in I've, or I've set up a call. There was an article published by Oh Jess, what constituency is he from? The one I'm going to meet next week. Oh, I am not sure what constituency is. Oh, just... It was it was um, James James Christian Wakeford. Yeah, it's uh, it's Bury North, Bury Bur North, Bury South, Bur Bury South, Bury South. So yeah. he, this new MP, wrote an article, and he talked about um, that the holiday feeding program should not just be for this year; it should be a permanent thing. I was reading this article, and I'm, I check, I'm thinking, is he a Tory? And I thought, wow, but he won a Labour seat, so he, he's very different how we'd be thinking about things. So I messaged him and said how refreshing I found his article and I think I tweeted it out saying you know this is great you know really great to read this so we need to reach out to those MPs who 
we've had difficulty, Stephen, in the past getting some Conservatives along. As you know, I might get the odd one. We need to reach out to some of these new, bring them in, and then go forward. And Sharon, do you think that we should continue that campaign then of inviting MPs in for lunch, in for a school meal? Yeah, um, absolutely. That is the best way. Get them in, get them to say how good the food is, and then, you know, whisper okay, in well, that ear. I hope everyone's listening to that and make sure you invite your MPs in and get your schools uh, you know, involved in that. And if you need some support with, you know, with that, you know, drop us a line on the LASA website and we can give you some, you know, sort of some help with that, with some template letters or, or anything like that. So Especially uh, target those new Tories in those marginal seats. Absolutely. Get them on board because they'll all be looking to hold their seats desperately. And you know, they said now you've had a slippage like Marcus fight in the corner, they'll all want a piece of that. And let's all invite footballers into, uh, into our schools for a free school meal, then that's, well. the, uh, that's the other thing to do, isn't it? Because we'll, uh, we'll get the interest there. Um, clearly, sort of, we, we're coming sort of towards the end of time, Sharon. Um, I, I think, um, Jackie, is there anything that you you would like to add or any question that you might like to ask Sharon while we've got sort of the uh, screen time here? Um, just just very quickly, um, I think it would be really good um, if we could push again, as you say, with the um, Conservative MPs, because I, I do think you've hit the nail on the head there. So I, I would um, definitely support that. And I think... Um, it really would be good to get as many MPs invited in as we can, because obviously with the way things are at the minute, we're not doing some of the usual things that, that we can do. Um, but certainly getting them to come for a school meal would be would be superb. So, yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. And, and Kate, have you got anything that you'd like to add to, uh, to that in terms of sort of getting back to school and, you know, sort of getting children back to school and, and keeping interest in your service? I think really it's a matter of um, asking uh, Sharon to support the um, encouraging, safe encouragement of children back into school to get those numbers up so that they can eat a healthy school meal and to make sure that, you know, we've got the methods and, you know, that, so that the volume of pupils is there for us to make sure that our businesses are able to continue. And just to keep these good messages going, I think there's a lot of work to do on school meals um, in terms of funding and the future. And I'd like to just thank Sharon for all her commitment. Thank you, Sharon. There's, uh, I think that sort of the um, you know sort of the big thing has been that the Labour Party haven't necessarily been sort of um, on the front foot in terms of getting children back into schools and you know sort of we've now got the change that was announced yesterday from July the 4th about sort of reducing social um, distancing and everything else you know do you see that that will potentially change sort of your party's view in terms of schools getting back to normal and children getting back into school because that's the thing that we're all now really struggling with we know that we're coming up the six week holiday but facing into September and not knowing whether or not, you know, there's a, a, a real sort of emphasis for getting people and children back to schools yeah. and back to work. I'm sure that having sort of your party supporting that as well would mm. really be helpful to us. And I don't want to put you on the spot with that no, um, no. at all, because I don't want you to be like getting in trouble with Keir when it comes no, to... No, uh, no, no. Uh, and this, this, this said, is one but, of... Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this is one, is one of... Um, it's interesting, one of Boris's little spins, you know, him and Dominic Cummins are, are doing a job of work on us over this because we are totally supportive of kids going back to school. But Boris keeps spinning it as if to say that we're not because we're supportive also of the, the teachers and the unions and their concerns. And all we've done is try to put to the government that they've got to work with the teachers and the unions and the sectors to make it as safe as possible. And when you think about it, we built as a country a dozen 15 Nightingale hospitals within weeks. I've got one here that's mothballed um, near, the, um, near Nissan. They, they built all of these hospitals in no time at all. So why were they not equally at the same time building, you know, porter cabins, not even building, but just commissioning porter cabins. Remember, I was, I was in the 60s and I, um, we had loads of porter cabins. I was a child of the 60s when there was the baby boom in the 60s. 
and so loads of schools at the time didn't have enough space so they had to have porter cabins so you know why weren't we seeing loads of lorry loads of porter cabins being took into school playgrounds to sort of get ready mm. to have extra classrooms and social distancing you know the, the, if the will had been there if Gavin Williamson had really wanted schools to go back we wouldn't have had the government U-turn on June the 8th which said schools can't go back now. So Boris plays this very clever, twisty mm -hmm. game where he makes out that Kia isn't getting behind the schools going back. When two weeks ago, it was Matt Hancock saying, oh, um, no, we don't think schools are going to be able to go back till September now. They could have went back. We could have had kids back now if they'd delivered, if they'd put as much thought into schools and kids as they had into Nightingale hospitals. And, that, and I know that they they were vital, but so is getting kids back to school. So it's a bit disingenuous of them to sort of say, oh, you know, um, we've, we've been working flat out, because I don't think they have been. You know, has any school been given any extra facilities, such as a porter cabin, to help with social distancing? Uh, uh, tell me, uh, you, lots of schools I know still haven't even got the laptops that were promised to help those vulnerable kids. My schools are all still waiting for those laptops. So I get very exercised about this because we absolutely, I want my, I know where the kids in my constituency are better off and it's definitely back to school. So I definitely want them back to school, but I want it to be, you know, managed properly. Perfect. Brilliant. I think that, that, that sort of brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, I think we're, our hour's up now. So Sharon, um, on behalf of Lisa, thank you for, uh, for coming and, and talking to us today. Um, as always, it's a pleasure. Um, you know, we'll see you soon up in uh, in Durham somewhere, and uh, and um, you know, sort of, hopefully, our debate in terms of APPG can go on, and we can see our we can see some further success, and really work together to get infant preschool meals through to be preschool meals for all children. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you, Jackie and Katie, um, for your time this afternoon. Uh, and thank you to everyone else that has um, dialed in. Uh, I think there's a, a screen coming up, which just shows you uh, sort of our upcoming webinars. So uh, next Friday, July the 3rd, at 10 o'clock, we've got a webinar with uh, Alex Norris, Sharon, someone that you will know well, uh, in yeah. your former role for public health and patient safety. Um, we've got a State of the Nation address on the 9th of July. Um, it's a school food panel discussion, um, and we've got an update on the LASA Allergens project on that uh, day, um, led by Jessica Crane, uh, who's been leading our Allergens project. And then on Wednesday, the 22nd of July, a change of pace, we've got our school chef of the year doing a live demo. Um, so Holly's going to be doing that. And then we've got Greta DeFater, who many of you will have remembered from the spring seminar, talking about human capital and the importance of school meals in terms of children and their development. So thank you for today and, uh, and thank you to uh, everyone that's taken part. Thank, thank you. you. It's been really enjoyable. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Keep thank up the you. good work as well when you, when you all get back fully Thanks. also. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.